I'm going to turn it over now to our moderator for uh, this afternoon's uh, panel discussion, Don Campbell. Don? Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you very much for showing up. And uh, we're all uh, anxious to uh, be able to answer some of your questions. Uh, let me uh, preface that a little bit by saying there's absolutely nothing classified left in the program. So there's uh, nothing that you uh, can't ask us that we can't answer within reason. <laughs> so uh, don't be afraid to ask the questions. Uh, uh, I'm sure somebody, uh, either one of us up here on the stage, uh, we've got several people in the uh, audience that can answer the questions you have. So. Or we could make it up. Or we make it up. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. We're good at that, you know. People ask me, how, you know, how, how do you go through that? I said, uh, no, I'm going to say something that a lot of you in here won't understand. Uh, I, I took Arthur Murray lessons. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> I learned how to tap dance years ago, right? <laughs> hey, Don, you remember we, we uh, got really good at that back before it was declassified. Exactly. <laughs> anyway. What uh, we'd like to go through, uh, just uh, I'm doing a little brief introduction uh, right now. We'll do a panel introduction, go through a couple possible areas of discussion, uh, and at the end we'll have a little uh, thing called a tribute to Kelly Johnson, a little film. And uh, afterwards we'll be available to answer any questions or uh, walk around the aircraft, whatever you like. But uh, uh, as we get started, I'd like to uh, go through and start with the introduction of the panel members to you. And uh, we have uh, Jim Shelton. Uh, Frank Stamp, uh, Dave Peters, and, and John Murphy. Uh, if I could, could I, uh, Jim, start with you? Could I uh, get you to go through and uh, introduce yourself and explain a little bit uh, about uh, your history and what you've gone through? Well, <clears throat> my proper name, of course, is James, but I go by Jim. And <clears throat> I, um, my dad used to take me deep sea fishing off of Long Beach, California, and I'd get seasick. Well, I'm part of the draft age, so I said, well, I, don't, I know I can't go in the Navy. And I talked to the guys coming back from Korea that carried the rifle up and down the mountain with snow. So I said, well, I can't go in the Marines or the Army, so the Air Force is the best, best thing. Well, it turned out it really did. It put some direction in my life. I was just a street racing kid from L.A. And uh, like I say, the <clears throat> military put some direction in my life. They taught me how to fly an airplane, and once I started flying, I said, that's what I want to do. So when I left pilot training, I got uh, F-86 slash F-100 training. So we went out to now uh, to uh, Williams Field in, <coughs> in Phoenix, went through F-86 training, and before we could head off to F-100 training at Nellis, they said, oh, we need six fellows to go ahead and volunteer to go to Korea and fill the last F-86 outfit that the Air Force had. So all the bachelors, we all raised our hand and went over there. <coughs> so I was there for a year, enjoyed the F-86. Great airplane, very forgiving airplane. And it was neat to fire the guns. You fire all six machine guns in that, and it's like coming down strafe, and it just kind of sat there for a minute, and then it'd fly off. Well, in 1958, the Strategic Air Command was expanding. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the back seat of the B-47 and saying, where did I screw up? Because now, instead of a stick between your leg and the throttle over here, you got a wheel and six throttles over here. So I had to learn how to fly all over again. Well, I stayed with that for a while, and then I decided I wanted to go to the B-58 program, SACS Mach 2 bomber. So you went through F-102 training and then B-58. And when I got there, I had heard that there was some special airplane uh, and some of the people from the B-58 program were off to California for the special program. So as soon as I had one year on the base, I applied. Found out about the SR-71. And <clears throat> finally, in November of 67, I was able to get out to Beale, started flying the SR-71 in August of 1968, and flew it for almost six years, had a little over 911 hours in the air, airplane. Uh, great assignment. Frank, if you would. 
Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Frank Stamp. Uh, I'm, I'm a lot younger than Jim, so my history isn't quite as long. Uh, you can tell. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I grew up in New York City, uh, grew up in the Bronx. I went to high school in Queens, for those of you that are familiar with the city. I rode the subway to school all the time, just all the way through high school. But I got the aviation bug really early, and that, that high school kind of set me off in that direction. I uh, went to college. I got my uh, Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Technology from New York Institute of Technology. Uh, but I realized uh, before I ever got into that practice that I wasn't going to be any good as an engineer. I wasn't smart enough. So I uh, literally that day went down to the recruiter. This was in uh, 1969. I went down, to the, uh, went down to the recruiter and signed up for delayed enlistment and graduated from college and went to officer's training, officer training school. Uh, after completing navigator training, I went to my first operational assignment was to the RF-4, which is the reconnaissance version of the F-4 Phantom fighter. Very cool airplane. Uh, Dave flew it as well, and uh, really a lot of fun. I uh, I heard about the SR-71 program. It was it was I mean, it was open information. J Johnson had already announced the existence of the airplane, but was, you didn't hear much about it. But uh, I thought it'd be pretty interesting to try. So I did and got accepted and started training in 79. Uh, flew the airplane for four years with my front seater, Gil Bertelson, and uh, then went off to other assignments. Spent 10 years total with the SR program. But uh, met some great people and uh, really used to have some great relationships as a result. And Dave Peters. As uh, Don said, I'm Dave Peters. Um, I was born and raised down the, the road here in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, graduated from Wilson High School and then the University of Puget Sound uh, ROTC program and uh, went into pilot training at uh, Williams Air Force Base in uh, Chandler, Arizona. Uh, after graduation there, I went into uh, F-4s and uh, went to Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho where my son Eric was born. This, incidentally, you'll have to put up with all of this because this whole section over here is family. Uh, he, he paid him $50 a piece to show up. Yeah, I know. But a couple of uh, times uh, back and forth to uh, Vietnam and, and uh, after that, went to Big Spring, Texas, uh, Webb Air Force Base as a T-38 instructor where my daughter Jody was born. And... Uh, from there to Air Training Command Headquarters at Randolph as a T-38 uh, operations specialist in the uh, Inspector General's office. And from there I went out to Beale uh, in 1974 and uh, had several jobs there prior to getting accepted into the SR program. And uh, I stayed there uh, homesteading, so to speak, until 1986 when I retired from the Air Force. and. Uh, found the world's greatest part-time job as an airline pilot. And uh, I flew for American Airlines uh, and retired uh, as a Super 80 captain in uh, 2002 when by government decree, I became incompetent at age 60. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And, and lastly on the end, John Murphy. Hey. First of all, I want to thank you for being here. It's a real, real privilege for us to meet you and share our thoughts about the legacy of this wonderful program. One of the reasons why we all come here is because of these friendships that, have, that were created while we were in the program. There's been no other program that I've ever been in, and I was in the Air Force for almost 28 years, that has this kind of camaraderie. It makes no difference whether you're a colonel, a general, a uh, chief master sergeant, or a staff sergeant. We're all brothers in this together. So and we, we come here on our own dime. Um, and we're excited to, to spread the word. Anyway, I'm also like Frank from the Bronx. <laughs> and uh, Jerry Glasser over here is from Queens. I mean, there's a lot of us that are coming out of the New York metropolitan area. I know a lot of people wouldn't trust us <laughs> if they knew that. <laughs> you all talk funny. <laughs> Anyway, I graduated from Fordham College, and then from there, I, uh, I went to officer training school. 
Anyway, then from there, NAV training, and uh, I had three long TDY tours and B-52s to Southeast Asia, and then a, uh, a one-year F-4 tour, um, and uh, I really enjoyed it. But towards the end of that t uh, first tour, um, Bruce Liebman, who I used to fly B-52s with, said, hey, I think they need some RSOs. So anyway, I threw my hat in the name and ended up being accepted into the program and started with Buzz Carpenter, Wonder, just a wonderful, wonderful man, um, and, and my best friend. I've been to all his anniversaries, kids' weddings. I, you know, it's, it just goes on from there. I, I tell people I have better memories of working with his girls, especially around Christmas time, making sugar cookies <laughs> than I do with the airplane. So anyway, um, after that, I, I went to Air War College, and um, fr from there, I... Uh, went to the U.S. House of Representatives as Air Force liaison officer to the House and then a year in the Senate. So I, uh, I had a few other assignments after that. Uh, one of them was the combat support group commander at Clark Air Base. And I was the one that was there for um, the, the evacuation of tens of thousands for Mount Pinatuba. Uh, and that's a whole different story. Anyway, after the Air Force, I uh, ended up uh, going to work for Wally World, <laughs> Walmart, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I did, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, it was a change in the career. They made me an officer of the company. Uh, I was a chief operating officer in Europe. I ran security for the entire company. All these skills came from these guys. <laughs> so anyway, that's where I am, to, and, and I'm a cattle rancher today in northwest Arkansas. I've got a ranch there. So. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Don Campbell. Uh, I joined the United States Air Force in 1958. I started out on B-47 bombers. Uh, when we got the B-58s and the 305th bomb wing, I was in the same organization that Jim was, except I was there a little earlier. Uh, I was a B-58 crew chief, first uh, supersonic bomber. Uh, because of that, uh, I was selected to uh, go into the SR-71 program. Uh, Got to Beale Air Force Base in excuse me November of 1964, and uh, just uh, I had a little longevity there. I, I spent 20 the next 26 years in the SR-71 program. So uh, when I retired from the Air Force, I was a maintenance chief uh, responsible for all the aircraft assigned to Beale Air Force Base: the U-2s, the SR-71s, KC-135s, T-38s. I uh, retired and uh, was fortunate enough to have Lockheed uh, hire me as a maintainability engineer on the F-117. And I was an engineer and also uh, I was still cleared SRU-2. Uh, worked with Jim. Uh, we seemed to follow ourselves along the path there for several years in, on the same aircraft, one after another. Uh, I took a voluntary layoff from uh, Lockheed in uh, October of 1990 and I was offered a job uh, as a uh, engineer specialist and mission director for the B-2 bomber program. So for the next 16 years, I worked and uh, did uh, was responsible for all of the flight activity and the test activity for the B-2 bomber program out of Palmdale, California, and the delivery of all the B-2s to the Air Force. Uh, also got to work on Fire Scout, which was a drone helicopter, RQ-4 Global Hawk, and the uh, X-47 program. Uh, I retired totally in uh, 2006. Uh, I'm now an associate farmer. My wife raises honeydews, and I get to cultivate them. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to toss a couple pictures up here, and, and uh, I think you'll recognize some of these folks. There's a picture of Jim uh, when he was in a crew for us. No change, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's Frank. There's uh, Dave Peters and John Murphy. No changes, right? Everybody still looks the same. Don't we all wish we could go back to that time, I guess. Uh, anyway. True statement. I tried Grecian formula, but it didn't work. <laughs> I don't know who this is, but that, that's uh, 
that's what I had looked like before I had uh, silver or gray or whatever kind of hair you call it now, and, and a little bit more of it. So uh, that was my office. I had this beautiful uh, mural that was painted on a 22-foot section of the wall in my office. So uh, I'd like to just go through a little history with you. And uh, as you heard before, I'm not a pilot, so I'm not going to go to any flight stuff, uh, even though you guys got all, of, all the experts up here at the table. So if you got any information, questions about that, they'll answer it. What I'd like to do is take a little different tack and talk about the start of the program and some of the uh, issues that we had and uh, why I think this is the most incredible aircraft that was ever designed. And I think every one of us on this panel feel the same way. Uh, one of the greatest uh, technological achievements in the history of aviation, in our opinion. And uh, this whole program started out with uh, in a 56, 58 time frame uh, when they started uh, getting the idea that they needed something to replace a U-2, Project Gusto. Uh, when they settled on a, a program in 1958, it was called Archangel, uh, and that was the A-12 program. Uh, when the CIA uh, took it over after final design, it, it changed uh, operation, or Project Oxcart. These are uh, some of the design uh, phases of the aircraft. Uh, I thought it was a little interesting. If, if you look at the first slide, it, it says uh, U3 design concept. This was Kelly's uh, first thing that he did because they were looking for a replacement for the U2. So the first thing that he did was title it U3, and then that changed to the A series. The Archangel uh, was chosen as a name because a U2 program was nicknamed Angel, and this was the Archangel. Uh, we ended up with the A-12 aircraft, which you have a version of here. The M-21 is a, is a A-12 modified for the drone. Uh, but these are the design phases that it went through to get to the A-12. Uh, from A-1 to A-2, 3, 4, 5. Anyway, it was quite a challenge. They finally got down to the A-12. A uh, little bit of changes in it. Uh, uh, you can see the pointy wings on, on the... Uh, Center slide, uh, rudders are almost vertical. Uh, they uh, had a requirement to make it stealthy, so uh, they made some changes. And you can see the final design, uh, the ox cart design, April 62 on the right. This is just a little gee whiz chart. And I put this up there mainly because uh, it has some information. This is all A12 information. Uh, but the significant thing about this is the MD-21 uh, flew its first mated flight on 22 December 1964. That happened to be the same date that they flew the first flight of the SR-71. Both of them on the same day. This is the Blackbird family. Uh, just to give you an idea of all the different series, how many they were made, and were made, and uh, 18 uh, A-12 series, uh, three YF-12s, two M-21s, the rest of them were A-12s. From the M21 side of the house, 940-941. The only one left is 940. And then SR-71's off in the middle. Uh, just Anyway, just a little overview of uh, what the whole program uh, looked like. First flight of the uh, A-12 uh, in April 1962. First flight of the YF-12 was uh, August 1963. First flight of the... Uh, this, air, this is the aircraft here at this museum, 940. And uh, it, 22 December, 64. First flight of the SR-71, also 22 December, 64. And uh, uh, we had the bad news we got about two months ago. Mr. Bob Gilliland, our first uh, pilot of the first aircraft, passed away about two months ago. And so. This is a, a plan form a comparison between an A-12 and an SR-71. Uh, there's a size difference. Uh, SR-71 is about seven feet longer. It carries about 15,000 pounds more gas. Uh, it carries a lot more sensor load. One of the biggest problems that uh, faced the program uh, and that nobody talks about very much is the thermal challenge. That's why I titled this a monumental achievement, uh, aviation achievement. Give you some kind of example. Here's a Concorde, Mach 2 aircraft. Uh, Max surface temperature is about 260 degrees. This is a B-58. It flew at Mach 2. Uh, max temperature about 212 degrees. One thing about, uh, this is F-105, about our, what we call the Century Series fighters, the B-58 and all of them, in order to maintain Mach 2, you had to be in full afterburner. 
or in minimum after at least minimum afterburner for some of it, but you use so much fuel that your time was limited due to fuel consumption in the afterburners. Okay, so is there a significant difference uh, between Mach 2 and Mach 3? And so I was able to go back and get some test data on this aircraft. Uh, if anybody's never seen that before, that's a B-70. There were two of them made. It was a Mach 3 bomber. It had uh, six J-93 engines in it. Uh, but if you look at the specs on this thing, it's absolutely amazing. The entire program uh, was 129 flights, 160 hours, but the total of one hour and 48 minutes at Mach 3. And that's significant because when we started getting into looking at the SR-71 and uh, what we would do to inspect it and how to take care of it, we had absolutely no program to back up and go to to find out if there was any data uh, about uh, thermal challenges and what it would do for lengthy periods of time uh, at high, with a high-speed flight. Uh, so we had to be conservative and uh, do everything cautiously. SR-71 could do an hour and 48 minutes of Mach 3 time in one flight or more. This is an SR-71 thermal characteristic. Okay? You can see it's a little warm. The uh, top of the uh, engine nacelles uh, are 1,050 to 1,100 degrees. Uh, coolest point on the aircraft, uh, it averages probably somewhere around 520 degrees. Uh, a lot of them much hotter than that. Uh, windshield temperatures with a co cockpit's about 620 degrees. Uh, nothing cool about it. Uh, the significance of this is the fact that standard metals won't handle all of this stuff. The B-70 had a problem. Uh, it was a stainless steel honeycomb structure, and they started losing stainless steel panels uh, at high speed, and they had to finally restrict the aircraft to 2.6 Mach. They couldn't fly it over that anymore. And that's when the thermal curve starts going up, really hot. Uh, the SR-71 has a restriction also that you can't fly over 2.6 Mach without inerting the fuel tanks uh, with uh, gaseous nitrogen to keep the aircraft from blowing up at, at speed. It gets so hot. So, this is a J-58 engine that uh, is installed in the aircraft. The only uh, bypass engine uh, designed and in use the amazing thing about this is there's no time limit on the afterburner. When these guys go into the cruise leg of the flight, this is what the air engine looks like all the way through the flight with the afterburner lit. You can see why the nacelle temperatures get 1,000 degrees. You're talking 34, 3,500 degrees in the back of the afterburner. And it's like this for the whole cruise leg. It's a pretty amazing sight, especially when you stand right next to one when it's running like this. An amazing thing about the engine is the uh, engine grows two and a half inches in uh, circumference and six inches in length installed in the aircraft due to heat expansion. The aircraft itself grows th uh, three to five inches in length and width in flight. Uh, it has, uh, you can see some of the things that, that I've written down here. The engine made out of wasp alloy, but uh, Pratt and Whitney and Lockheed Engineering uh, just did a wonderful job on the design process of this because they, they knew this was going to happen, and so they designed the aircraft with uh, characteristics built into it, like uh, uh, corrugated wing panels to allow for expansion contraction, an actual uh, expansion joint built into the aircraft. Uh, you, you saw the information on the engine. Uh, had uh, loops built into the hydraulic lines and, and areas to allow for expansion and contraction. Had an actual slip joint, and all this is done with a, with a slide rule, okay? So I put this down here, you know, it took one RSP of memory to operate this. You know, anybody know what that is? That's a really smart person. That's what I put. <laughs> so I put that on there. But what we, what we have to remember is that there were no computers during this time period to help the engineers that put this thing together to handle the flight characteristics, the heat, the thermodynamics. It was just non-existent. So everything was done on a slide rule. Uh, so uh, it... Uh, it's amazing to me and to all of us that uh, we had an aircraft that was so safe and, and uh, good to use. Uh, I'll show you some stats in a little bit. Uh, as a maintenance guy, I'm extremely proud to, to say that we never lost a crew member in 27 years of operation. Lost one aircraft in 23 years due to a bearing failure on an engine. Wasn't anybody's fault, just had a material failure. So uh, it, uh, in my opinion, is one of the safest aircraft that uh, these guys could ever fly. It uh, brought them home uh, every time. 
Uh, so uh, we're, we're kind of proud of that. This next slide I've got up here, I'll give you a little uh, test. Uh, this engine uh, and aircraft is so unique that uh, Kelly Johnson told us one time if they made a starter generator that was powerful enough to light the fuel off and start the engine, it'd be half the size of the motor of the, of the jet engine. And I believe that because the uh, fuel is uh, not even a combustible. It has to be uh, lit with triethyl borane, which is a pyrophoric liquid, and uh, uh, 50 cc's into the combustion cha chamber to light it. Uh, but to start it, we had to rotate it with uh, different things. And one of the things they chose was this, and it's a, uh, we call it a Buick start cart. It's got this one I'm going to show you. The picture are uh, two 454 cubic inch Chevy Marine engines uh, hooked together on a Dynaflow transmission uh, and splined together where you have one throttle for both engines. Straight hitters going right down to the ground. And uh, it was a thrill of every crew chief's life to be able to start this. And I think the crew's got a little kick out of it, too. So I'm going to give you a little idea what that sounds like. That sound you hear right now is an air conditioner running to keep the cool and the equipment on the aircraft uh, ready. And the pilot's in the cockpit. You can hear the uh, start cart start, obviously, right? And uh, the crew chief's going to be sitting on the ground uh, with that throttle in his hand waiting for the pilot to say, uh, give him a go ahead and say, uh, you know, start this puppy up and we're going to go somewhere. One under each engine, and uh, it's a terrific sound. Uh, we've had a lot of fun with it. Something to remember when it's doing this, this has straight headers pointing down to the ground and the aircraft leaks fuel and the blue flames are blowing the fuel off the hangar floor. Does that bring back any hot rod days? <laughs> yeah. It'll be just a minute and the second engine will start. You can tell the difference between the tuning of the cart and it seems like it goes a little bit longer up to a higher RPM. I'll make it quit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it sounds kind of neat. Uh, the guys really enjoyed it, and we had a lot of fun with them. Uh, every once in a while, uh, one of them would blow some pistons or something, you know, and you'd have uh, rods and pistons hitting your feet. But other than that, they were pretty good. We had some alternate sources for starting the aircraft, uh, uh, just as a quick note. It took four dash 60, uh, 60 PSI hot air units each, to four of them per engine to start it with air. Uh, early in the program, when they came up with the YF-12, uh, there was an interesting concept. And uh, anybody in here know what a black powder cartridge is on an aircraft engine start? Anybody? Okay. Standard Air Force uh, military black powder cartridge they use on F-4s, B-57s, KCs, B-52s, 106, uh, 106 had an air start. Anyway, three pounds of, of powder. The system they tried with the SR-71, because of the size of the engine, they had to redesign and come out with some new cartridges. 
there were eight pounds of explosive per, per cartridge. Six cartridges per engine. And uh, we're kind of glad it didn't work real well. Uh, it was extremely dangerous. So, uh, yes, Jim. Don, a quick story about the start cart. I had to abort one night for loss of generator. I go into Mountain Home. They have a, it, I asked for a hangar space. All they had was a fuel cell for the F4. So all I could do was get the nose of the SR in there, go to bed. Next morning, the maintenance guys are there. The base commander is very curious. He's driving out up and down. And finally, he decided to stop, and he asked the maintenance men, um, what's, uh, what's that dripping off the airplane? Is that a little water? Oh, no, sir, that's GP7 fuel. It's not a problem. And about that time, they start up the start cart, where, the, where Don said it's blowing the gas off the floor and those open exhausts. And the base commander took one look at that thing, and he said, you get that out of my hangar. All I don't want to fire here. And they had to tow it out, start it all over to find out if it was a generator or a constant speed drive. It, uh, they, they just wouldn't understand. I, tra I had to travel all over like these guys did, but uh, you know, I'm the guy that had to put the team of people together to go get airplanes when it landed somewhere else. And uh, our biggest problem was uh, I, I would make it a point to, uh, first of all, to meet with security to talk about our security requirements. And the second person I talked to was a fire department because I wanted to talk to them uh, specifically about the fuel because these guys aren't used to having fuel that doesn't burn, you know? And uh, also we had a chemical ignition system, the triethyl borane. It's a pyrophoric liquid. It burns immediately upon 0.001% oxygen atmosphere, and you can't put it out. Uh, you can make it stop burning for a little while with triple F foam, but as soon as the foam disappears, it starts burning again. And uh, so uh, the crazy thing about uh, uh, the triethyl borane is, is that if you want to neutralize it, you pour fuel on it. That's a, that's a true story. So it's a uh, parts per million thing. Uh, if the triethyl borane is less than 1,300 parts per million, it's chemically deactivated. Anyway, so along with that, so this is kind of what the, uh, the start cart looks like. Uh, it has a probe, uh, like a periscope, connects to the bottom of the aircraft. The cart has one throttle. Uh, you really don't care about RPM or anything else. What you do is you watch that little white gauge over there on, a, on the top right-hand side and it's all done by torque. Uh, the magic number is 700. Once it reaches 700 pounds of torque, it'll automatically disconnect uh, from the engine. And you don't want to do that if you just have a TEB light and your engine is starting to go because your EGT will go crazy. So that was our limiting factor in what we worked with. This is the top of the probe. That's how the uh, gear engages in the bottom of the aircraft and under this. And that gold-looking stuff on a gearbox really is gold-plated. All of our engine oil components were gold-plated to radiate heat. So, what uh, I'd like to do is uh, uh, go through a little bit and, and uh, ask our panel members if uh, they wouldn't mind discussing with you uh, some uh, exciting event that they've had uh, happen to them and their uh, experience in the SR-71 program. And so, Jim, could we start with you? Well, in uh, 1973, when the Israelis and Egyptians started the Yom Kippur War, um, the Russians were supporting the Egyptians, and of course we were supporting the Israelis. However, the Russians were setting satellites up constantly to check what was happening. We couldn't afford to take a satellite out of one of the Russian orbits to move it down over the area, so they asked if the SR-71 could cover the area. Of course, sure, very easy. So they planned a mission to take off from California quickly air refuel, and air refuel over Nova Scotia area, then a beam Portugal, go down the Mediterranean, refuel again by Cyprus, go down the Suez, make a 270 degree turn around Cairo, and come cross this way. So that you had a big X over the battle area at the time, then come back and refuel at Crete, and recover in England. <clears throat> was going to be a nice eight and a half hour mission. Well, the maintenance people hop on the KC-135. They're on their way to England. In the meantime, we're starting to take the briefing. It was about 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night that we were taking the briefing. And all of a sudden, the 
Um, thing I remember about the briefing, the intelligence officer says, oh, don't worry if the Israelis or Egyptians shoot at you. We haven't told anybody you're coming. I said, oh, well, thank you. The next clue was that uh, if you had some kind of a problem, you tried to find a military base uh, overseas to recover at or a neutral country. And if you found a neutral country, then one of you could stay with the airplane. The other one could go downtown and try to contact some friendly consulate to get you out of there. Fortunately, none of that happened on the, the missions. But the, all of a sudden, right in the middle of the briefing, they cancel the briefing. They tell you to go home, you know, and stay in crew rest. Well, my goodness, I'm a guy that would take one seek and all sleeping tablet before a mission to make sure that I was well rested. So now at 11 o'clock, I'm well rested. I'm ready to go fly eight and a half hours. Well, that, that canceled. Come back the next morning, and they said, oh, we found some fuel, some of our fuel, at Rome, New York. And um, on a side, one cart on a side car, uh, railroad siding there, the test force out of Palmdale was going to fly up in another week and do some low-altitude ECM checking of equipment. So they had a maintenance, uh, Lockheed maintenance recovery team at Rome, New York. So the next thing was, well, let's go to Rome, New York, because we can fly from Rome, New York, subsonic over to the Nova Scotia, Portuguese, Crete, come back, Crete, Portugal, Nova Scotia. So our eight and a half hour mission just went to 11 hours and 20 minutes. Well, on the way over, the mission planners normally bypass large cities. I think they just drew a straight line from the end refueling California to the holding fix for Rome, New York, because we're out there and beautiful clear nights. One of the few times I've looked outside the cockpit but I could see Chicago out the left window and Indianapolis out the right window. And I told Gary, my nav, I said, we're really creating a sonic boom on the ground. Well, it was so bad that they had so many phone calls about sonic booms or broken windows. They were going to send a second aircraft one hour behind us. Well, he's at the end of the runway, ready to push the power up. They give him a total new direction. And there was enough noise created that the professor out of uh, one of the northern tiers said, because the sonic boom was so large and so long, it must have been a meteor. Well, right away, the Air Force said, that's good. We're not going to tell him he's wrong. So we get to um, Rome, New York, and started down for the uh, landing. And you normally turn your landing light on about 10 miles out. Well, the landing light on the SR is kind of tipped down because you've got a nose up when you're touching down, and you want to be able to see the runway. Then once the nose touches down, then a smaller light looking straight ahead is called a taxi light. So you turn that on. Well, I come down, turn the landing light on 10 miles out, get over the end of the runway, and I said, oh, landing light's burned out. So I quickly turn on the taxi light, touch down, hope it gives a little light out there for that. Well, then the base commander that was meeting us said, oh, boy, they told me this was such a secret mission. You you really were keeping it secret. You didn't even turn your landing light on until you were over the end of the running. I didn't want to tell him that the light had burned out. So I think we rested about a day and a half and flew out, flew the mission, and... One of the funny things that happened to me, I normally don't take tube food. This particular time, since we're going to be 11 and a half hours, I took a couple of tubes of apricot. Well, it looks like a tube of toothpaste, and it, it's all sealed, but you have this plastic tube you screw on, and then it breaks the seal, and you go ahead, and there's a feed port in here. We put water or apricot. I forgot my, my science that here we're 26,000 foot cabin pressure and the tube is manufactured at sea level and I go to break the seal, next thing I've got apricot coming out this way and what, what wanted to do. 
So the, the second one, I was smarter. I screwed it partially on, didn't break the seal, put it in the mouth, turned, broke the seal in my mouth, so I didn't have apricot all over the place. <laughs> but that was um, one of the best missions that, that I had flown. We were the first to fly the, they flew nine, what we call giant reach missions, anywhere from 11 hours and 20 down to 10 and a half hours. Uh, one of the things that uh, John Murphy alluded to is uh, the, the closeness of the, uh, the squadron, ma squadron mates and especially the guys that you flew with. One of the things that we haven't mentioned is uh, this airplane worked on a strict crew integrity basis. You got teamed up with the, the guy that you're going to fly with uh, right when you both arrived on station at Beale and you went through the year of training together. And then you stayed together uh, with uh, very few or almost no exceptions. You always flew together. Uh, and a, a lot of that had to do with the degree for very close crew coordination. You really had to know what the other guy was thinking. I was very fortunate to get crewed with a fellow named Gil Bertelson. Uh, unfortunately, sadly, he passed away about a year and a half ago. But Gil was an interesting guy. He was. Uh, uh, straight arrow, no smake, no uh, drinking, no smoking, no cussing. Straight arrow Mormon that had the greatest sense of humor you could possibly imagine. Uh, but we got along great. Um, we uh, were, uh, and one of the things that I needed to mention to reinforce is that, uh, like I said, Gil was very straight arrow. He didn't use cuss words or anything like that. That's kind of a postscript to fast forward. Now we're checked out. We're flying an operational mission takeoff on, uh, I think it was 20, 21 March of 1982. We blasted off into a clear morning sky of Okinawa, thinking it was gonna be a, a pretty normal operational sortie. Uh, we got to, the, uh, 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 got to the point where Gil pulled the throttles back to level off before we, at about 25,000 feet uh, to hook up with the tanker. And uh, right at that point, he said, Frank, I got a left fire engine. I got a fire engine light on the left engine. Um, well, you know, that would normally make you not happy, but we've, tra we've trained so hard for this kind of stuff and went through all that simulator training uh, that it all kind of came to us like, uh, you know, second nature. So we started going through the checklist procedures. Gil did what he needed to do uh, with the immediate action, bullface face procedures. Uh, but the fire, fire light stayed on. So, of course, we declared an emergency, started dumping fuel to get back down to a landing weight, uh, set ourselves up uh, uh, on an extended straight-in single-engine final approach. Uh, one thing to note here is that the final engine, uh, single-engine final approach speed is significantly higher uh, than normal approach speed would have been. So we're kind of barreling down the down the runway, but our simulator, or toward the runway, our simulator training was so good that we went through the checklist procedures just like it was in the simulator challenge and response. And it was going like clockwork uh, through the whole thing. We were pretty confident everything was gonna be fine. Well, with the left engine, uh, after we'd shut it down uh, because of the fire, the left engine was the engine that uh, uh, powered the, the hydraulic system for our normal landing gear. Uh, we, we got to the point where all of the other checklists were done, we're ready to go, and I read the step to Gil, okay, uh, emergency landing gear handle pull. And what that's supposed to do is uh, it, you pull out about a six or a nine inch cable, uh, Gil does in the front cockpit, and it unlocks some locks that mechanically let the landing gear come down one by one and drop into place by gravity. Well, we got to that point where I said, the uh, Gil, uh, emergency landing gear pull, and I didn't hear anything back. And that kind of concerned me because up to that point, we'd just been going like clockwork. I was just about to repeat the step, and I heard from the front cockpit the scariest thing I've ever heard in my life. Gil said, well, fart, Frank. It broke off in my hand. What do I do now? My eyes lit up like this because I, I knew Gil would never use foul language like that. 
And what happened was he pulled the T-handle with the attached to the cable and it broke and the cable just went fluttering back into the instrument panel, which left him with the broken T-handle in one hand and the stick in the other and both of us with no landing gear. Okay. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> no, tell them, tell them that you can't land unless you get the nose gear down. Oh, you want to hear the rest? <laughs> sorry. I thought we were on a time limit. I'm sorry. So um, we went through a whole bunch of thought processes. We thought maybe we would climb back out. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of gas, but we'd climb back out, ask him to send one of the tankers up, refuel, give, time, give us time to think about it. Uh, and uh, then we thought about maybe just strapping, uh, tightening up our, our belts going out over the South China Sea and do a controlled ejection. Uh, but about the time we were talking in that tone of voice, uh, Gil noticed that there was just a little bit of windmilling RPM on the left engine. Windmilling, uh, the compressor blades of the engine were, were rotating because we were going down final approach so fast. So uh, we talked about maybe using that windmilling RPM to see if that, if that might be enough oomph. So we went and reversed the last couple of steps. You'll put the normal landing gear handle down and left main, landing gear, um, left main landing gear wheel uh, came down right away. That's good, but not great. Uh, a little while longer, the right main landing gear came down, and that's good, but the dash one, the emergency procedures told us that you don't land with no nose gear because the airplane would just break in half. It was just too long. So we waited, and about an hour and a half later, it seemed like it was probably about 30 seconds, uh, the nose gear uh, came down and locked, and we just a few, few seconds before touchdown, Gill touchdown did a great job. Uh, we came to the end of the runway, uh, uh, came to a stop on the runway. Uh, the, land, the tower told us there were no visible flames coming from the airplane, so that felt pretty good. We climbed down the maintenance uh, truck's uh, ladder, and our crew chief was staring up at the engine, and there was a huge 18 to 24-inch hole burned right through the titanium cell of the engine. It fired really burned that hot. And uh, it was it was pretty amazing, but... I, I thought that after a day like that, when we went back to our BOQ rooms with our buddies to have what we used to call post-mission hooks, drinks after a mission, to kind of talk about what went over, I said, if Gil doesn't start drinking after that episode, I don't know who would. <laughs> but thank goodness, St. Peter move over, because Gil kept his promise. <laughs> Dave, if you would. It seems like there's an awful thing about fires and left engines. Um, Don and I had talked about this uh, pretty extensively before, and, and the reason, the only reason for bringing this particular incident up is to illustrate just how tough this airplane is and how amazingly it can hold together with stuff you just can't believe. Um, my backseater, Ed Bethert, and I were, were flying a uh, mission over Cuba that uh, required, it was, a, it was an optical camera mission and it required us to be over Havana at 10 o'clock in the morning their time. So that uh, necessitated us taking off out of Beale at uh, about two o'clock in the morning. It was uh, middle of the winter, uh, no moon night. It was about the same color as all of the side panels here in this room. So we took off, uh, everything went fine, went up to uh, near Boise, Idaho and refueled and got completely full, got cleared to climb and started our climb out up basically over the, the main spine of the Rocky Mountains. And we were going through about uh, 67, 68,000 feet, Mach 2 plus, and the left engine firelight came on, which I told Ed and of course, as uh, Frank pointed out, we immediately went through all of the uh, emergency procedures that included shutting down the engine, shutting off the fuel. And uh, Ed's next question was, is the light still on? The answer was yes. He says, well, what, what do you think now? Well, there, in the top of the front cockpit canopy is a periscope. Well, I was looking in the periscope and I said, well, we're on fire. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, there's fire coming out of the left nacelle 
it's rolling across the fuselage and bouncing off the right vertical stabilizer and going back across to the left side. He says, I thought you turned off the fuel switch. I did. So he proceeded to go into uh, declaring an emergency and figuring out exactly where we were going to go while I took care of getting the airplane started back down again. When he got done with that, he, he uh, asked me again, he says, is it still burning? Yeah. And part of the problem was we were completely full of fuel and we had one engine shut down and I was trying to get rid of as much fuel as I could because we had a minimum safe altitude over the Rocky Mountains of 17,000 feet. And uh, every time I would try to dump fuel, I'd get a low pressure light on the other engine because the combination of dumping the fuel and having the afterburner running was too much for it. So I'd have to discontinue. Uh, we sat there going along. Ed says, what are you going to do? That was one of Ed's famous statements. <laughs> he was always doing, what are you going to do? I said, hey, Ed, you ever hear or ever see that John Wayne movie, The Flying Leathernecks? He went, what? I said, yeah, you know, John Wayne got shot up in his P-40 and it was on fire and he couldn't seem to get it out and he decided that he'd go into a power dive and see if he could go fast enough to blow it out. Ed goes, no. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> so I got it going downhill and uh, it, it's really, it, it, I still don't know if that really affected it. But uh, I got up a little over 500 indicated, and the fire went out. And so we got it, uh, we got it under control and, and diverted to Hill Air Force Base there at uh, Salt Lake City. And we were still dumping fuel as we came down final approach, uh, single engine, and made our, our landing in a snowstorm. The, the significance of the whole thing to us, as Don and I have talked about it quite a bit, um, our best estimate is that airplane was burning for five, about seven to eight minutes. And he's going to show some things uh, that they found afterwards. And I'm, I honestly don't believe that had it been any other airplane that I've ever flown or anything that I know about, I don't think it would have survived. But uh, this airplane not only survived, we got it back on the ground. They had to do quite a bit of work on it uh, to get it put back together again. But it was fine. Put it back in service, and it flew until the program ended. Thank you, David. I asked Dave. Uh, <laughs> I asked Dave to tell that story because I just happened to have some uh, pictures of uh, what the aircraft looked like uh, when it landed. And uh, he give you some time frames. Can you imagine if you had an aluminum aircraft with JP-4, JP-5, or JP-8 on board, the, the entire left wing engulfed in flames for seven to eight minutes, what would happen to that aluminum airplane, right? It wouldn't be here, right? Uh, and uh, I go back to the statement I made before. This is one of the most forgiving aircraft we ever had, and it has to do with the titanium that it's made out of that loves heat, can't get enough of it. So anyway, so we sent a team up to uh, Hill Air Force Base, and... This is the, uh, the engine comes out sideways on this aircraft, so the wing goes up in the air, and you, uh, this is a, a E7 uh, Ed Hill, Hall, excuse me, Ed Hall that worked for me, and uh, he's uh, inspecting everything, and what they found, uh, the cause of this was uh, this little bitty line right here broke, and all during the time that he was doing his refueling with a KC-135, it's filling the, the uh, it's coming out at about 1,800 PSI, and so it's filling the whole doggone left nacelle full of fuel. And uh, it's, it's not enough fuel flow to even make any difference on anything, but it's, uh, it's enough to make a mess. And uh, so anyway, so, you know, he got done with the refuel, uh, disconnected from the tanker and started his climb. And when they did that to light the afterburners, you uh, have a shot of triethyl borane uh, in there. And when it lit off, well, it took all the rest of it with it. And the amazing part about this is, I mentioned a little earlier, that the uh, nacelle temperatures on the aircraft are about 1,000, 1,050, 1,100 degrees. Uh, right next to that engine that's just hotter than all Dickens, you have a full fuel tank in the wing. I mean, it's completely full of fuel. Uh, but it's got a nitrogen head on it, so it's inert. So it's no explosive hazard. 
you know, and that, that goes a long ways in, in making it safe. But anyway, so that's the line that broke. The, uh, these are some of the uh, thin titanium ribs uh, inside some of the structure on the nacelle. Uh, it warped them. This is a, uh, it's almost like an I-beam. It's, it's a very heavy uh, gauge titanium ring. It goes around in the cell. Uh, you can see the warpage on it and the gray discoloration uh, from the burning of the fuel. Uh, okay, so the bottom line of this is this, is that for safety's sake, Lockheed Engineering had us change that outboard wing and so they flew one up on a, on a C5 from uh, Palmdale. We put a new wing assembly. It's not much of a deal. Six uh, hinges at the top, you disconnect some hydraulic lines. The biggest thing is you have to have a, a crane. They took this wing back to Palmdale and the metallurgist from Lockheed got a hold of it. And one of the first thing they did is they put a cutting torch on this ring and, and titanium has this characteristic that's amazing. It has a memory. When they heated it up, it returned back to, to original configuration, okay? Metallurgists looked at the wing. They declared it was stronger than the day it was made. They recertified the wing, put it back in service. We put it on another aircraft on fire for seven to eight minutes. Uh, you look at the outside, you couldn't tell anything was wrong with the airplane. The airplane's black anyway, but you, you look at it from the outside, you can tell anything's wrong. So, uh, and, and I just wanted to point that out because uh, it's just a great doggone airplane. I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm gonna, uh, uh, John, you wanna give us a little idea of some kind of good story you got? Well, this may be a different twist. Um, people will ask me, well, what was it like? Um, you could see the curvature of the earth and all of that. Did you sit back and enjoy it? I don't think any of us had time to ever do that. You're so focused and working as a as a crew, uh, pilots uh, looking at those gauges. Um, for me, I never stopped flying the airplane. I'd be taking a shower in the morning, got a fire in the right engine. Your hands are going back, right, right and left to the circuit breaker that might need, be needed to be pulled. And you went ahead and did it. It was almost mechanical. So if we had fire or smoke in the cockpit, we would have that kind of visibility. So I thought that was uh, very interesting. Also, when you go through training for a year, you'll learn about his grunts and his groans. <laughs> we had one flight out of um, Mildenhall. It was uh, going to be into the Middle East. We had scheduled five refuelings. Um, Buzz and I went out the night before and had some dinner, and he ordered a seafood dinner, captain's plate, and uh, I, I didn't order that. I think I got a hamburger. <laughs> but anyway, so we geared up and uh, went, took off the next morning, and um, we hit our first tanker, and <laughs> coming off the tanker, I hear, oh, I said, Buzz, what's wrong? Oh. <laughs> well, anyway, he had a good case of diarrhea. <laughs> You know, he keeps talking about a Mach 3 turd. <laughs> well, yeah. No escape, Buzz. You want, you want to talk about what happened when, when, when he landed? You guys painted an SR brown? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Buzz told that story. They uh, took a, a SR TITAC and it comes black and they painted it brown and, and uh, gave it to him as a trophy. <laughs> I'm dead. I don't have any of these crazy flight experiences, uh, but uh, being the maintenance guy that uh, had to go uh, collect them if they had the disfortune of uh, landing somewhere else, uh, the craziest thing that ever happened to me, and, and I've had a lot, of, after 26 years, you gotta have a lot, right? Actually, 30 years I spent in the military, but anyway, uh, we had a, uh, a static display. Now, I call these tragic displays because that's how everything always ends up, and so, we had to go to Dayton, Ohio with an SR-71 uh, for uh, kind of an air show. And uh, we always went up the day before in a KC-135 so we could have our equipment. And just as a quick note on that, we could use nobody else's equipment on this aircraft. We couldn't use nobody else's parts, nuts, bolts, nothing, tools, uh, nobody else's tools could be used. They all had to be special. All of our equipment was sterilized and, and uh, uh, came out of our own supply. It was checked for compatibility because there's over 2,000 items that are non-compatible with titanium. Titanium has its crazy characteristics that no other program ever comes across. Things like masking tapes, uh, 3M for example, masking tape is not allowed to be used on the aircraft. The reason for that is, is that the glue that they use uh, on that 
uh, when it's subjected to temperatures over 450 degrees, turns to an acid and it'll burn a hole in the titanium. Cadmium is the same way. Hundreds and hundreds of items on the aircraft that you can't touch. Uh, we even did uh, tests with bird droppings. I had to give guys uh, classes, Audubon classes, to learn how to identify birds and uh, issued them tongue depressors and plastic bags and binoculars and they'd go around a hangar scraping up bird droppings and we'd send them down to Rye Canyon Laboratory for testing to see if they were compatible with titanium and that's a true story. So uh, uh, we did this with everything we had. Uh, I had to get chemical warfare suits uh, exempt from the entire SR-71 program because the chlorine content in a chemical warfare suit was so high. Uh, engineering said if we touch the aircraft with it, we couldn't fly over 2.4 Mach. Anyway, on and on and on. So anyway, so we've got this uh, tragic display at Dayton, Ohio, and, and um, we had to, us maintenance guys, we had to load our own airplanes. So, you know, so all of our equipment, we got to load ourselves on a tanker. So we load the tanker up and we get ready, we're screaming down the runway and we lose water. I said, oh great, you know, now we got to abort, we got no water. And then we brought it back, they troubleshot it for a while, and said, hey, we're not gonna be able to fix this. Oh great, now we have to download all the cargo, load it up on another KC-135, we get ready to go, it loses a generator. Uh, and no spare generator, so oh, great. So they said, well, we gotta get the third airplane ready. Well, I mean, we're all exhausted by this time, and so we've determined now that we're not gonna leave till the next morning. We left Beale Air Force Base about an hour before the SR-71 did. Now, who's gonna get to Dayton, Ohio first, all right? Okay. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, I talked to the pilot, you know, and made a, a, had him make a couple of calls, and, and uh, we tried to delay things as much as we could so we could have a, at least land, get on, landed on the ground so we'd have time. But as it turned out, turned out that we get up to altitude and everything looks good, and all of a sudden I heard this right over the wing hatch, blew a seal. I said, oh, geez, you know, this is our third airplane, now what do we do? And so I went up and talked to the pilot, and I said, uh, you know, uh, you get down to a lower altitude. I said, you know, give me uh, 20 minutes or so and see if I can stop this thing. So I went over and I uh, got the water container and, and uh, a couple rolls of toilet paper and uh, went back and you wet the paper and you find your, your pressure leak going out to seal and you feed wet paper through it. And when it hits the atmosphere, it's so cold, it'll freeze and stop the leak. Well, I went through a roll of toilet paper and all the water and it didn't stop. So then I started on the coffee. And uh, when I got about halfway done with the coffee, I got the leak stopped, and then I went up and said, hey, you can go ahead, we can fly into Dayton. And the funniest thing was that we land at Dayton, and uh, I mean, this is just absolutely crazy. We land, we just turn off the active, we're going down the taxiway, and the SR-71 hits a runway. I said, great, all of, our, all of us are on board this tanker. We've got all the equipment on board this tanker, and we're still moving to, to park that airplane. So I go talk to, walk up, and I talk to the pilot, and I said, hey, I, I know it's uh, tough, but I says, uh, you know, get up to the parking place as fast as you can, because uh, I gotta get some people off this airplane. So he taxis up, uh, that was a mistake, and you'll hear in just a minute why, but he gets up there and park. We, uh, before the engines are shut down, we open up the interway door, and I get the guys down with headsets and chocks, and uh, they run right next door, and the SR taxis right in next to the, to the tanker. I mean, they're like 50 feet apart. So I'm sitting there, you know, and said, oh, gee, at least we got it that far. Well, here comes the fire chief, all kinds of red lights. Got hot brakes on the tanker. And he comes up to me, he says, move that airplane. I said, I can't move the airplane. I don't have a tow bar. It's on the tanker. Well, start the engines. I can't start the engines. The equipment's on the tanker, you know. Well, what do you want me to do? And I told him, I said, well, if it was me, I'd park my fire trucks in between that gray airplane and this black one, and I wouldn't let this black one burn, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so anyway. That's a, that's a true story. Well, what do you do? You're in this uh, thing. But it, it points out to one of the things I was trying to say. Everything on the aircraft is specialized. We couldn't use anybody else's tow bar. It wouldn't fit. There was no other equipment on anybody else's base that would start the airplane. Uh, you know, we had it all captured in that, in that KC-135. So the funniest part about that trip after all of that was as we were taxiing in, I could look out on the side, and there's all kinds of people all lined up in the runway, and they're all running over, and everybody's pointing at the airplane that coffee and toilet paper had stuck to the side of the airplane. There's this big brown stain <laughs> along, along the side of the KC-135 and, and said, oh, well, you know, this is, this is really the, you know, showing people how we take care of each other. Anyway, so <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So anyway. <laughs>
I left this slide up behind us up for a little bit so you guys could t uh, take a look at that and spend a little time with it. Uh, it's got some amazing stats. You can see that we flew more than 3,551 operational missions with our crew members, okay? 11,675 hours at Mach 3. Mr. Jerry Glasser down here did some calculations for me and this is what we came up with. 11,700,000 miles at Mach 3, okay? I don't know that anybody knows the whole count of how many missiles were shot at this aircraft. I know it was a lot. None of them ever hit. We had a mission success rate that was second to none in the military operations, uh, right about 98%. Never lost a crew member. One aircraft in 26 years due to engine bearing failure. Uh, myself, uh, as a maintenance guy, I'm real proud of that fact. So uh, anyhow, world speed records. The uh, Four in orange with the asterisks uh, were set on the last flight going into the Smithsonian. Uh, the rest of them were done uh, during the period. Uh, some amazing facts up there. So. The Air Force didn't want, a, want the um, crew to fly that uh, speed run on the going in. They thought it would be terrible to have it set all kinds of speed records while it's flying into the museum. Yeah, yeah, we just got rid of the fastest and highest flying aircraft in the world, and we're really proud of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you've got a whole bunch of people in here uh, like us that uh, think this thing should still be flying, and these guys would still be flying it if they'd let them. Yeah, it says altitude and horizontal flight is 85,000. 68.997 feet. Do you want it in meters? Okay. <laughs> As uh, Mr. Jim Shelton uh, reminded me, I jumped the gun on that a little bit. Uh, uh, we'll go into some question and answering now, and so uh, we'll have some uninterrupted time till now until they kick us out. So uh, uh, we've got folks with microphones. Uh, if uh, anybody's got questions, raise your hands and they'll come see you. Start right down here in the front. Thank you. First of all, can you hear me? Yes. First of all, thank you um, to the museum and to you, gentlemen, and your families that came here to uh, make this happen. I certainly appreciate listening to your stories. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. My questions. The first one, I get the impression that you don't have very good visibility from inside the plane looking forward. That's an impression I got when I was sitting here in that pseudo cockpit that we have at the museum. I was wondering if that is true. The second question is, um, you were showing the different phases of the design of the Archangel aircraft, I think. Um, it was quite interesting to see how it changed shapes and forms as they were going through the different stages. I imagine that it wasn't a single Lockheed engineer that actually came up with the design. I imagine that different factors, different constraints, different design forces contributed to it. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. In other words, the final shape seems to be the product of multiple people designing the aircraft. <laughs> anyway, it, uh, in our earlier briefing, somebody mentioned that uh, uh, there was a, another company, uh, Convair, that was trying to uh, develop a, a Kingfish aircraft uh, to uh, do the same kind of thing. Anyway, but uh, in, I believe it was September 1958, I've got a drawing that shows uh, a little red circle uh, written uh, by Kelly that says reduce radar cross-section. Uh, and that started some of the significant changes in it. But uh, propulsion had a lot to do with it because they were talking about hydro all kinds of uh, rocket engines and all these different types of things. And, and uh, But it was not a single person effort. You're absolutely correct. It was a group effort by some of the greatest engineers that we've seen. Uh, ben Rich uh, had his finger in it. Uh, we have a very good friend of ours, uh, Pete Law, that was a thermodynamicist uh, that uh, had his finger in it. Uh, Kelly Johnson, and I don't know all of the engineers, but uh, 
uh, a lot of it, the uh, final A11 configuration had the pointy wings and all that kind of stuff, to, you know, to, to blend that all out, uh, obviously it had to have something to do with the radar cross section. Uh, but uh, Jim, uh, you know, do you know anything more than that? I mean, uh, I, I know it wasn't one engineer that went through all those designs, but. Uh, no, I don't. Well, the, uh, the other question was about visibility out of the front of the plane. Yeah. First of all, when you look at the data, all those designs were done within 13 months. Can you imagine doing 10 designs in 13 months? And the first seven designs were ramjets. Yeah. They were not uh, 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 compressor turbo bypasses. So you saw ramjets on the wings, a uh, very dangerous operation. So the first seven models, we were thinking turbojet, ramjet, turbojet, ramjet. And then what happened? We took the turbo bypass. So model 8, 9, and 10 in the 11, that's when the J58, when, when Ben Rich uh, coupled the inlet to the engine. And that's what changed things dramatically. But if you look at it, you'll see ramjets on the first seven. Yeah. I can't imagine flying two ramjets in the wings. And uh, it was a very difficult problem. But the, but the turbo bypass was the answer. It was the answer. Thank you very much, Jerry. Visibility from the front. Uh, oh, visibility. Visibility from the front. Anybody uh, want to cover that? I don't know, Jim. What do you think? I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, because what seems strange is usually when you look at the front of the airplane, you think, "Oh, you're trying to peek out through those two two little diamond-shaped windows." No, that it's, it's like your car. You got a you got a brace on either side of your windshield, and you just kind of look around, and you got a side window. We had side windows there, and so the visibility was very very good. Um, because, like I say, too many people try to think that that's all you're looking out is that little triangular piece on there. Mm. But just like your car, you got a side side window. Now you know you with this pressure suit on restricts your head movement a little bit, but uh, you had ample visibility. About the, about the only time that uh, that that came to be a factor was in the, the final phases of landing when you get it at, at, at a pretty extreme angle of attack and uh, seeing out over the nose to see the runway w was somewhat restricted, but it's, it certainly wasn't any kind of a problem. If I may, there's a, there's a backseat implication to that forward visibility question too. We had in the, in the rear cockpit, there's an optical viewfinder that allowed us to look directly, the, the backseater, to look directly below and slightly behind, but also, I don't remember the exact number, but some number of miles ahead of the airplane. Uh, and that mostly was used for the backseater to help him do his navigational checks on the, on the nav computer. But there was at least one instance that I know of, and probably more, uh, Edie, I mean, uh, Bernie Smith and Edie McKim, one of our crews, was making an emergency night landing in North Dakota in the middle of the winter uh, and terrible visibility. And they were in Hurt City. They really had to land. And Bernie was flying the airplane right down to as far as he was supposed to take it. And he could not see anything. And right about the time he was going to have to go around, Bernie, uh, Edie McKim, his backseater, says, I got the lights in the, in the viewfinder. Bernie, keep coming, keep coming. And, uh, and just pure blindly trusting, and this goes back to the crew coordination factor too. Bernie just uh, uh, took the, in, the input from, from ED, flew the airplane in the darkness and pulled the power back and they touched down. And, uh, so there is, there's something that you wouldn't expect, but there you go. And here I thought the view site was so you could look down and say, yeah, that's I-5, turn right at the next intersection. <laughs> that is it. Yes, I have kind of a two-part question, but first I'd just like to say thanks uh, for you guys to coming out, coming out and talking to us. And for the people who in the room aren't real aviation buffs, uh, these are true American heroes. I recently retired as a... Uh, I recently retired as a Navy test pilot, so uh, my wife and I are lucky to be here today to, to hear you guys speak. Uh, but I would like to tell you guys that to this day, and I've worked a lot of different programs, that the SR-70 program, SR-71 program with Kelly Johnson is still the model to which everyone aspires to. It's just truly amazing.
So the question kind of comes back to, uh, you talked about, somebody mentioned something about a missile shot or something. So my two-part question is, what did you have on board as far as a radar warning receiver? Was it the old ALR-43 beeps and squeaks? And what were the tactics uh, that you utilized if you were ever engaged? Maybe some of you guys were ever engaged by a surface dirt missile. Frank? John, you want to tackle that? Frank? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, I think the question was what kind of electronic defensive systems we had. Um, first of all, is Mike Hole in the audience? Just Mike isn't yet. This I, the only reason I'm looking for him. He's he's one of our experts on that system. I'm, I was a user, but not an expert the way he was. Uh, we had uh, pretty sophisticated defensive elect electronic defensive systems that worked very effectively against the older uh, threats like the surf SA2 Soviet built surface to air missile system. Uh, we weren't overly concerned about. Uh, engagement by those kinds of surface air missiles uh, or most of the air-to-air -air missiles that were prevalent around the time the SR. Uh, we also had a good air-to-air -air elect uh, electronic cap uh, defensive capability as well. Uh, we did have uh, uh, probably a per not a perceived threat so much, but we didn't know as much about the SA-5, which was at the time, again, that we were the latter years of our operating was the premier surface to air missile concern that we had. But we had a pretty good system that we thought would, in fact, handle that effectively. Uh, and again, uh, we didn't get as much practical uh, knowledge about the uh, that system against SA-5 because as far as we know, they didn't fire any of those. With the SA-2, as somebody mentioned, there were quite a few firings, mostly during the North v uh, during the Vietnam War. So there was a lot of data to look back at in, in terms of effectiveness. But uh, the, the short qu answer to your question is that we did have very effective uh, defense electronic defensive capability against both ground and air-to-air -air threats. You talked about the missile. There was one a CIA pilot named Den Denis Sullivan that the CIA went to Okinawa about nine months before the Air Force went over there. And he was on a North Vietnam mission and got the fact that uh, receiving information that they had launched. He looked in his mirror or in his periscope and saw a bunch of explosions at about his altitude. When he came back, the maintenance folks found a piece of shrapnel from one about the size of a fingernail is as close as they've ever come. Okay, we have a next question down here in the middle of the room. Um, I, I noticed on the SR-71 fun facts, they talk about 11 uh, SR-71As and 171B, the trainer, lost if i gather no crew were lost but how were those 12 ships lost <laughs> well some um one i remember was uh, basically a pilot error issue night re air refueling in a full of fuel and started to pull off the tanker and got a little too slow and the nose came up on him and uh, they had to jump out <clears throat> the, another one, you get your navigational, uh, your attitude indicator driv driven off the nav set. Well, he's they're letting down coming into Beal, and the uh, nav set started to twist on him a little bit, so he's getting erroneous information on his attitude indicator, and next thing he realizes he's this way and not this way. Because the standby attitude indicator in the early airplanes was down off to the right. Uh, they jumped out. Later, they went ahead and modified the cockpit presentation where the primary attitude indicator was here and the standby was right above it. So you had a good quick cross check if there was something wrong with the two instead of stuck way off to the side. Another one, the factory lost one on wet runway. Uh, testing they were doing slipped off the runway. Uh, we had the one you've got the forward body of the one that um, uh, at the time they didn't know if a tire or wheel broke and poked a hole in the airplane on takeoff and 
So now it's got fire really coming out the back because the fuel, the afterburners have lit the fuel. And uh, the pr abort procedure is throttles to idle, deploy the brake chute. Well, that the brake chute deployed, and next thing it melted because you got a nylon chute there and a big gob of fire. And at Beal and Kadena, they had a pop up barrier that had some switch plates to go ahead and time when to shoot the barrier up after the nose gear crosses and to catch the main gear. Well, the barrier popped up a little too high on the right side and it was cut and the airplane runs off the ground. Um, in that case, the nav said, oops, I don't know if I can run away from a burning airplane, so he ejects. The pilot plane stops, he opens a canopy, comes back to help Jim get out of the cockpit and he's looking around because there's nothing but a hole there now, no seat, no nothing, no canopy. Here comes Jim down in a parachute over, over here. Um, let's see, how many? Oh. Yeah, no, it didn't, it didn't burn, but you've got the front, front of it here uh, on display. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Pull the Pull handle. handle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one of, one of the things that, uh, that, that people forget about, uh, when you're at, at 85,000 feet at Mach 3, that what is called Q or indicated airspeed is really quite low. You're, you're in a way worse heart. If you're sitting at sea level going 700 knots, you're probably not going to make it. But you know when you're when you're up there with a lower uh, uh, indicated airspeed and Q force, it, it's really not a big deal. It's not part of it. No, it's just a, it's just a seat. The, the, your basic enclosure is the is the spacesuit. Uh, it does have uh, what we call stirrups that are connected to the back of your boots with a cable, so that when you pull the, the handle, it, it pulls your legs and feet back into the seat so that uh, you know, you're know you not flailing around with your legs. And of course, you're holding on to the handle, so you've got your arms down where they belong. And then once you exit the airplane, there's a drogue chute that helps stabilize it as you free fall down to, to uh, altitude where you'd separate from the seat and then subsequently have the parachute come out. If you want to read something really interesting, uh, Google uh, Bill Weaver uh, ejection sometime and, and read that. Uh, Bill uh, was uh, forcibly uh, ejected uh, out of an airplane at, at Mach 3. Uh, didn't use a seat, uh, and uh, he lived to tell about it. So read that read that story off of Google. It's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Bill Wheeler. Bill Weaver. Weaver, I'm sorry. Yeah, Weaver. Any uh, questions? I have another one uh, down here towards the front. Thank you. Uh, I just had a little statement. Uh, I worked in a reconnaissance technical group that got some of your work. Uh, you know it well. Huh? You know him well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, this was in, at uh, Hickam. And uh, it seemed like we had kind of a more personal point of view when we worked with SR-71 uh, missions that came in to us. And it was, it was kind of interesting because we knew there was a man on board versus the, the satellite information that yeah. we got in. So it, it kind of made it special for us. Uh, the one question I did have is, did anybody have an unstart on any of their engines in flight? I, I, the, the question should be, how many did you have? Okay. <laughs> how many did you have? <laughs> and, and tell everybody what that is, I guess. More than we wanted. Well, what you have to realize is that you got to get the inlet started first before it can unstart. So at um, 1.6 Mach, the spike starts going back in, the inlet gets bigger and bigger, the opening gets bigger and bigger because the spike goes inside. And when you get to 3.2 Mach, the, the spike is all the way back in the hole. There are pressure doors controlling that supersonic shock wave at the optimum spot. Now, once in a while, the earlier program that I flew had an analog computer handling that shock wave. And sometimes it couldn't quite keep up with the air pressure changes right like that. And so then you would the supersonic shock wave would go out the front 
and that's called an unstart. And then you run the spike back out, get the supersonic shock wave around the spike, pull it back into the hole. But it creates, the inlet creates some 50, 53% thrust. So it gives you a yawing situation when it, un, when it unstarts there. Well, uh, the early days, it, it, you'd bang your head because you, you and you talk to your nav and say, well, which, which side of the canopy did you bump your head on, the left or the right side? If you bumped it on the left side, that was a good engine. Um, they quickly set up a, a sympathetic unstart. When one unstarted, the others sensed it and drove both spikes forward. So you're flying along, just kind of brrrr, and quit thrusting there for a couple of seconds, and then it gets restarted, and you continue on your way. Look, and you got an unstart all the way back here on your engines, and, and uh, you know, the pilots, up are, I, I've never measured it. What's it, 35, 40 feet up, up in front of the intake pilot? It's good. It's a good distance, but you know, it's like you're on the end of a wet noodle when that thing starts going loose. So uh, it bangs you around pretty good. Yeah. I also also just wanted to thank you guys for being here. Um, I was I feel like I was the kid in the video, uh, growing up, owning all the books, reading, uh, but making models as a kid. Uh, it's always been so fascinating. Um, I've, and yet I've learned more in the last four years about the Blackbird thanks to people doing the uh, forums like this as well as the videos, uh, the Pensacola series, Jim, I think was yours. Uh, I saw one of your, I've watched that probably three or four times, so I wanted to thank you guys and encourage you to keep doing these forums and videos and interviews whenever you can. It's a thousand times more informative and interesting than uh, dry text, for sure. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, uh, we see the things that you do as being absolutely insane, uh, incredible. Every little nuanced factoid or uh, piece of Blackbird lore that we hear about is just mind-bending from uh, the weight of the plane when it was full to the temperatures, all of that. Uh, I wanted to ask, what was mind-bending for you? What did you have difficulty wrapping your head around when you first went through your first year of training? Or what impresses you about... Uh, the A-12 guys having to go up there solo and have to do everything kind of by themselves. Was there anything that stands out to you as being earth-shatteringly amazing? <laughs> well, uh, you know, one of the things that I found really interesting, um, I had uh, uh, taken an airplane down to Palmdale to, to go into maintenance, and we're sitting around there, and, and uh, Colonel Tom Pugh, that was later wing commander, was the commander there at the at the uh, Palmdale plant and uh, we're standing around and they had one of the uh, A-12s that was in storage and apparently there's a period of time that they go through that they had to inspect it and, and do things. So they had it all opened up and he says, hey, you want to look at that? And I said, yeah, you know, climbed up in that thing and sat down and I went, man, these guys all need to be institutionalized. This, you got to be insane. The biggest, the biggest instrument, I'm not Kidding a lot. The biggest instrument in the cockpit is right in the middle of the instrument panel, about that big, and it's a turn and slip indicator. You've got a little bitty attitude indicator down there. Start looking around. There's a switch that says cameras on, cameras off. You know, I mean, this guy's up here, and and, and none of the automatic stuff that uh, that Don and Jim's folks have talked about, as far as the inlets, it's all manual inlet. And yet these guys are out there flying around all by themselves getting this job done. And they did a hell of a job with it, too. But uh, It was a real busy cockpit for a single pilot. And that's one of the reasons yeah, when the Air Force said they went, wanted an airplane like that, they said they wanted a two-person airplane to help relieve some of the pilot's stress. Because I, I was amazed at those guys. Yeah. You were asking about, you know, your, personal feeling and how you felt about it, flying it. Um, every single time I flew the airplane and I got out after we shut down and I kind of turned around and looked at it and I says, I cannot believe it's that freaking big. 
<laughs> because it doesn't fly like that. It, it flies like, like any other high-performance airplane that I ever flew. It's just a, it's a great, great airplane to fly physically, but it is a big airplane. <laughs> From a maintainer standpoint, I'll, I'll, I came off of B-58s. Uh, Jim was B-58s. Uh, anyway, uh, on a B-58, like a lot of the Century Series aircraft, you, you, you've got a, a supersonic aircraft. You need a clean surface for aerodynamics. Uh, the B-58, uh, a lot of the panels on the aircraft, all of the screws were recessed. They had aluminum plugs in them, and you had to shave it down to have a smooth surface. You know, the first time I saw an SR-71, I says, my gosh. And this is supposed to be a Mach 3 airplane. It's going to fall out of the sky. Uh, you uh, go underneath it. You can't do it on this aircraft. It's so high in the ground. But you, you get around one that isn't if the museum would let you do it. All of the, uh, on the top and bottom of the aircraft, uh, the basic fuselage is round. And then you have what they call fillets, the uh, titanium sheets uh, that put that curvature in it. That's only 20 thousandths titanium. Okay? And those crazy things are held on with three screws. And you're flying at 2,000 miles an hour. Uh, I, one of the things I used to do is show people uh, the difference. On, on the bottom of the aircraft, there's little panels with a, a fastener in it. You poke the fasteners, the spring pops, and the panel drops down. You can put your hand inside that panel and put your fingertips on the titanium. You can see your fingertips moving. Okay? And this thing flies at Mach 3. And, and that just boggled my mind to, to see that. You know? So uh, don't misunderstand Never tell me. us that. Pardon? <laughs> Now you tell us that? <laughs> Jeez. But the comparison, and, and what you find out is, is the uh, aerodynamic the configure it's completely different. There's a, like a boundary layer of air. There's a very much, uh, not much airflow on the aircraft at, at 2,000 miles an hour. And it changes the whole concept. Uh, it, it's just different engineering. It's, uh, it's really crazy. Questions? Was the aircraft r retired because of replacements or otherwise orders? Would anybody like to tackle that? <laughs> Buzz, Car Buzz Carpenter. <laughs> Overflights. Overflights that we were doing would no longer be necessary. It was costing $85,000 an hour to operate when you put in. It was a, um, a combined program. When you looked at a fighter wing, uh, you had the fighters, and then the support was separate. Uh, a lot of things were rolled into the SR line, so it looked like it was spending a lot more money than was actually being spent directly on the program. But I think the, the big, well, the, and the satellite community said, oh, we can do all that, although you uh, you can predict where a satellite is going to be for the next 100 years. But I think the main thing is we didn't get through developing a data link. And if you look at the world, I retired a few years ago, and the, and the metric to our president is less than 10 minutes. When I flew a mission for President Carter, he probably didn't get John Murphy and I flew it. I'm guessing the president who had monitored our flight didn't get our information for probably, I don't know, 24, 30 hours, 40 hours, because you took the film, you took the recorders, you had to process it and then get it out. U2s and other things flying today, as they collect the information, it is being offboarded and it's going to the decision makers. We, uh, it was quite interesting when we first uh, deployed to Okinawa. Uh, we didn't have a mobile processing center in place at that time. And so any time we would fly a mission, a C-130 would taxi up to the hangar uh, by the taxiway in front of the hangar and do a right-hand 90-degree uh, uh, turn and then reverse props and back into our hangar. And as the guys would download the camera and the film, they'd slip it right on the C-130, and they'd fly all the way to Yokota, Japan for processing. You know, I mean, that that's... Uh, you know, we're talking early technology. Uh, a few years later, we put our own uh, mobile processing center in uh, at Kadena. So, anyway. Don, I just want to make a comment. Uh, several people after the last uh, panel asked me uh, how many pilots actually flew operational missions. And <laughs> it, it, they were amazed with my answer. And what I told them was 87. Is that right, Buzz, or is that close? Close. 
85. <laughs> well, think of that, over 25 years. I mean, these pilots just were amazing. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out. This was not a great big program. Are you trying to get points? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Okay. Um, for the uh, pilots here, you know, you see movies like Top Gun and stuff like that, and you have uh, call signs for the pilots. Did you guys have call signs? And can you talk about PMS difference between uh, a Blackbird versus your other uh, things you worked on? PMS, what? Plan maintenance scheduling. Oh. Somebody want to tackle the first part of that? Yeah, we didn't. We didn't have call signs. We had, now that there were static call signs uh, for the state side for the training missions, uh, Aspen uh, usually uh, three zero and and uh, above. If we had more than one airplane flying, uh, all of the call signs that we used as far as operational missions were all uh, computer generated. So, no, we didn't. We 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 didn't have any Mavericks. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You ask about uh, you know, the scheduling type thing, and, and let me preface that uh, with with this: and, uh, the Air Force standard, uh, current standard for maintenance man hour per flight hour now is like 15 to 20 is what they'd like uh, maintenance man hour per flight hour. When we first started this program, I mentioned a little earlier, we had no previous data to go to to find out what was going to happen when you flew an aircraft at uh, six, seven hundred thousand degrees for an extended period of time. So when we worked with engineering at, at Burbank to say, okay, how often do we look at this aircraft? And, and we've got no data to go back on. And so for, to be on a conservative side of the house, what we set as a at the first uh, inspection cycle was this, 25 hours of flight time or 10 hours of hot time, Mach 3 time, put the aircraft into a major inspection because nobody knew what that 10 hours of Mach 3 time at all those high temperatures was going to do. We had several issues that, that compounded this problem. The aircraft started leaking fuel. Okay? When we first got the aircraft, we thought, dang, we got to fix that. So every time we'd get one that we thought was a little bit major, we would take it out of the flying cycle, we'd pull it into the barn, and, and you'd have to jig the airplane to pull the upper wing panels, and it had to be a sterile atmosphere, and you had to wear a full suit and mace, face mask, and on and on. I mean, hour after hour, and, and uh, cook the wing panels in an oven for 24 hours before you put them back on the airplane with a sealant. Uh, and all of this increases that maintenance man hour per flight hour. Mm -hmm. The 25 hour inspection increases the maintenance man hour per flight hour. After about eight months in the program, our maintenance man hour per flight hour was over 700. And think about that from a cost factor. I mean, it's hu absolutely huge. We were trying, trying to fix every fuel leak. The aircraft set on a ramp and leaked. And we had to keep people on duty seven days a week, 365 days a year, to do nothing but drive around the airplanes and empty the drip pan so it wouldn't get on the concrete. Okay. Well, we finally uh, uh, surveyed the ramp and put a drainage system in at Beale Air Force Base to collect all of that. And then we stopped fixing the fuel leaks. Okay. Uh, because, first of all, it wasn't a safety hazard. Didn't didn't affect the aircraft flying. Uh, and that dropped all that. And then... Uh, over the period of the next few years, we completely rewrote and revamped all of the inspection criteria on the aircraft, uh, and we got it up to a 400-hour cycle. Uh, that's a little bit better than 25 hours. Okay? But still, that cumulative uh, maintenance man hour per flight hour over those many years increased the cost of the program, and uh, believe me, a lot of people didn't like that. Uh, the logistics tail on this aircraft is horrendous, uh, and uh, it, it just it costs money. Uh, but... Uh, We got it down to 106. It's as low as we ever got it. Pre-flight, five guys, eight hours. Post-flight, about the same time. A phase inspection uh, uh, cost you uh, 21 days uh, out of the flying cycle. Uh, and I mean, you absolutely destroy the airplane. You know, all engines out, all the panels off. Uh, uh, it's got, uh, I, would have, I would have loved to have challenged Lockheed Engineering to give me a count of how many spot welds they put on the titanium, but each one of them had to be inspected with a three million candle power light and a magnifying glass uh, and for, for cracks uh, due to heat, thermal, and uh, just uh, many, many things like that, uh, and uh, just added to it. So did that answer your question from the inspection? Okay. Wait a minute. 
Uh, yeah, my question is in regards to the flight characteristics of the plane itself. Uh, when I was at Wright Patterson a number of years ago, I I met uh, an older gentleman that had flown the F. I think it's the 104 Starfighter, and he had said that that thing, as it got up to speed and came back down from speed with thermal expansion, he would get weird little nuances with the stabilizers and the and the elevators. And I'm just wondering if the uh, if the plane flew weirdly, if you will, as it was. Uh, going up to and coming out of speed if you guys notice anything like that did the, did the heat seem did the heat seem to bother you guys in your flight profiles no no i you, i don't even think you noticed anything no not really mm -mm. yeah oh yeah i'll tell you yeah about the only thing that did for us was help us cook the sloppy joes <laughs> <laughs> Does it fly the same at Mach 3 as it does at a couple hundred miles an hour? Pretty much. Yeah. The airplane was really, uh, I think, very stable at, uh, at Mach 3 and to hand fly it. It's, it's really pretty easy to fly. One, uh, and also, when you were subsonic, um, I used to go ahead and demonstrate to the students that you could turn the stability augmentation system off as, when you were subsonic. You didn't need the extra gyro assistance on there. It flew just like a regular airplane with a support system off. And remember, this is not a fly-by-wire. This is a cable airplane. Yeah. Think about that. The airplane goes from minus 40 degrees to plus 500, and the cables are designed specifically for that. And as Dave is correct, you can hand fly this airplane at Mach 3. And Dave, you know, it's, it's a gorgeous woman airplane to fly at Mach 3. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. But it's a cable airplane, not a fly-by-wire airplane. Let, let me pick up on that for just a second because an interesting point is, and he talks about cables. Can you imagine trying to develop a, 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 a fly-by-wire system that could put up with a 3 to 6-inch expansion? Think about that, okay? The cables were made out of Elgiloid, and they had the same expansion contraction rate as the aircraft. Uh, so that you know, and it was designed into it. And I, I don't know how you do that with fiber optics. Okay, what's that? Put loops in it. You think that would work? Okay. How about how about the thousand degrees heat? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, but the same, but the same thing I believe is true. I've always been told that. Uh, the reason we didn't have more digital in the cockpit is because the cockpit heat uh, just wouldn't put up with it. So everything is analog. Question. I've, um, I, my, uh, my dad worked as a radar tech in Vietnam, and although he didn't work on the Blackbird, in that community of aircraft radar techs, he heard a couple of Blackbird stories. I wonder if you could comment on one. I know the published uh, altitude is 85,000, but one of these guys had gotten a trouble report from an SR-71 that said altimeter failed at 110,000 feet. That was a trouble report. Does that just mean the altimeter was broken <laughs> its readout? It means the altimeter failed a lot before 110,000 feet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I always wondered if it was like a, you know, a, a secret. Uh, the other one had to do... No. There's a lot of folklore, okay, yeah. <laughs> bad information about that. The, the aircraft was designed specifically, Buzz, uh, to fly at Mach 3, Mach 3.2 at the most, and at altitudes of 85. So, you know, anything beyond that is just fiction. <laughs> just means the altimeter failed. This, uh, the other one was about electronic countermeasures. Uh, this was uh, um, from a guy who'd worked on uh, F-4s and was told never, if you see a target, moving very quickly, never ever lock onto it. But he forgot one day and did, and the radar set just went out. Um, and I wondered if, uh, so apparently he was hit with uh, electronic countermeasures, he assumed from the SR-71. Would that be? I, I, I actually talked to our Elan guy, uh, Mike Hull, about somebody else asked that same question, and, and uh, uh, we've never heard, uh, our Elant guy has never heard of that happening. That's that's especially, he said, but the system, if, if the circumstances are right and everything, were powerful enough to, to uh, knock somebody offline or something. Y'all know about burning the system up. But uh, anyway. 
Um, now that the aircraft is not flying anymore, is there a danger that we're going to lose the know-how, the engineering behind it? Right. It's like it's mm -hmm. we're not flying it. We're not building anything like this. Um, you as a community have a lot of in-house and tribal knowledge, if I can use this uh, wording. So is there that danger that we will lose this know-how? We lost it a long time. They lost it a long time ago, in, in my opinion. I, uh, I was asked uh, in 1987 uh, to be part of a study uh, for the National Aerospace Plane Project, X-30. And uh, I can't remember every company. I know General Dynamics is one of them, and uh, 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 North American... Uh, I, I can't remember the other one. I, I think it was Northrop. Anyway, they had gone to Lockheed uh, because they wanted to get in competition for the uh, X-30 aerospace plane project to replace the space shuttle. Well, they had no experience at high speed, high altitude, or with any of this uh, heat issues. And so they went to Lockheed and asked Lockheed for that information. Lockheed said, hey, that's proprietary. You want it? Go, go earn it. So the, these companies then went to DOD, and now DOD paid for the senior crown program for, for this information. And so they sent them to us at Beale. And the thing I learned within the, the first uh, hour or two of talking to these engineers that came in, uh, first of all, they found it very difficult to believe what we were telling them about what, what this airplane went through and what we had to do to maintain it. It was just, it, it was, they had never heard of it. This is, this is crazy. You know, you can't live like this. We've been living like that for 15 years, I mean, you know. But they had no, absolutely no clue, okay? And uh, uh, you, was it you and I got in a conversation about this a, a little bit earlier? Uh, there's very little, in my opinion, very little interplay between aerospace companies uh, as far as data, uh, projects, and that type of thing because of classification. And there are times when I, uh, yeah, and graduation money, but there are times when I think that in the interest of our national defense, there ought to be a little bit more of it. You know? So uh, anyhow. Well, you were talking about uh, engineering. They're working on hypersonic, and it seems they're having a tough time getting from 3-2 Mach to three or to Mach four to Mach five, but you know, the engineers are working on it and it'll take them a while, but they'll get there. Thank you all for coming. I know that you all paid your own way here. So thank you very much. And thank you for your service to this wonderful country and happy birthday to Frank. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> And a special thank you for assigning my airplane. It's your airplane, really. <laughs> okay, we're going to have... Uh, wait, 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 we could get you to sing happy birthday to him, though. I mean, yeah. We're going to have time for two more questions. I have two gentlemen here who have been waiting very patiently. So, Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, you told your story about the three KC-135s uh, having issues on your way. Uh, what was the operational readiness of the SR-71? Was it, um, did, did you ever have problems where missions couldn't be fulfilled or you had to keep swapping aircraft like that or was that just a bad? We, uh, if we had a very uh, uh, high priority mission, uh, we would do a prime and a backup uh, just to ensure that uh, uh, if something happened, we could send the second airplane. Uh, it may sound funny to a lot of people. There were very many incidences where our takeoff time was takeoff plus or minus zero. No leeway whatsoever on many of our missions. Isn't that correct? Correct. I mean, that's how tight they were. And uh, uh, there were instances where we lost, launched a backup in order to maintain a mission. But uh, uh, we would uh, put crews in both of them. Engines are running. Navigation's aligned. And, and they're ready to go. So if, if uh, one has to drop out, the other one's uh, immediately right there ready to go with him. Uh, dep again, depending on the priority of the mission, not every mission was that way. Uh, One of the other factors in that, too, that's, that's interesting is that uh, from the crew standpoint, because uh, we were not allowed to fly operational missions except with an integrated crew. And so uh, we, ha we would have a backup we call mobile, which was another integrated crew. And uh, if something happened, and it has happened several times, I'd was involved in, in uh, one of them. Um, if one of the primary uh, crew members got sick or something else happened that they couldn't go, the whole crew would come out and the replacement crew would go in. But you always had somebody prepared and they knew what was going on. They were, they were up to speed and ready to go do the mission. I, 
That slide I had, remember that, 3,551 operational missions. That doesn't include all the training missions and everything else. And so I, I guarantee you that somewhere out of that 3,551, we had a few incidences where we had some issues. Okay, I mean, there's just no doubt about it. So anything else? Other right, we have uh, one last question down here in front. Yeah, of the 3,500 operational missions, how many of them included a leg segment over denied territory? Over what territory? Denied territory. Any uh, missions over denied territory of our operational missions? The only, the only ones that I could think of was the ones over Vietnam. Well, Cuba. We had Cuba? North. Oh, Cuba. Yeah, Cuba. We had North Vietnam, and then... Um, they flew about a total of six or seven over North Korea. You could make three passes over North Korea and take care of the whole section of North Korea, and they found out that most activity was down by DMZ, and so those they would fly us through the DMZ once in a while because by a fluke, um, the camera, they used to go ahead and turn the camera off just before you started a turn. Well, one of the North Vietnamese missions... The camera stayed on in the turn, and all of a sudden they're picking up stuff in China over here. So then they decided, well, it, the camera works in a turn just as well as straight and level. And so then you could uh, go ahead and make turns into the DMZ area. So we didn't need to fly over North Korea, um, Middle East, along the periphery of China, uh, Cuba. All those came on after I got out Nicaragua Libya 1986 but I think the primary question may be for the USSR there were no direct oh overflights. no direct no man no manned overflights there were no direct no, no manned, manned overflights, overflights of the Soviet Union and nothing Everybody over China you, when's the, you know, no we did not overfly the Soviet no, Union the only thing that overflew China was Chinese pilots and U2s that got shut down and the D21 drone when it was connected with the B-52. Because of the capability that they were talking about with the, uh, uh, the photography that could be taken in a turn and with our radar imaging system, you could look out far enough that there, there really wasn't anything that was needed to be known that we couldn't see and still not be overflight. Do what? Oh, no. Could you sustain knife edge flight? No. Uh, we, our, our, what we called a high bank turn was 45 degrees of bank. Okay. Uh, we are going to have to wrap it up. I want to thank uh, every one of you for uh, sticking with us uh, this late in the afternoon. We really appreciate it, and uh, we... Uh, Thank the museum for uh, having us here. Uh, it's uh, been a great pleasure for all of us, and uh, thank you very much.